I'll stand. Let's, let's sing Shabbat Shalom together. And then when we do that, we're going to um, go ahead and recite that wonderful command that applies to today. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Hey, Hallelujah. And the Shema. We're going to sing the Shema after we do this one. Let's recite together. Six days you labor and should do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your Elohim. You do not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. Hallelujah. Amen. Hear, O Israel. Please join with me in the Shema. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod Mahakuto, Leolam Vahayad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom for all eternity. Amen. And then the Ve'ahavta follows the Shema, which means a new shall love. Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Elohecha bekol levavcha uvekol nafshecha Uveko mehodeka, veha yu hadvarim ha ele, asher hanoki, mitzavaka yo, alevo veka, vishim nam tam leva neka virdi bartabam, vishim tekaba veheteka. Uva lekteka vaderek uvishak beka uvku meka uvshar tam leot tayodeka veha yuleta thafot bene neka uktak tavo mazuzot veheteka and you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Amen. Then we have a blessing before the reading of the Torah. Baruch Yahweh Hamivorach 
Baruch Yahweh Hamivorak Leolam Vayed Baruch Yahweh Hamivorak Leolam Vayed Baruch Ata Yahweh Eloheinu Melech HaHulam Asher Bar Karbanu Mekol HaHamim Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Yahweh Baruch Shemo Notein HaHatorah Amen. Bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. Please remain standing if you can for the reading of the Torah. Today's Torah reading starts with um, chapter 12 in uh, Genesis through verse 4, and then we're going to read chapter 14 through chapter 15. And Yahweh said to Abram, Go yourself out of your land, from your relatives and from your father's house, to a land which I show you. And I shall make you a great nation, and bless you, and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, and I shall bless those who bless you, and curse him who curses you. And in you all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram left as Yahweh had commanded him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Chapter 14. And it came to be in the days of Amraphel, sovereign of Shinar, Aryak, sovereign of Elisar, Kedorla, Omer, sovereign of Ilam, and Tidal, sovereign of Goim, that they fought against Bera, sovereign of Saddam, Bersha, sovereign of Amora, Shinab, sovereign of Adma, Shem Eber, sovereign of Tseboim, and the sovereign of Bela, that is, Tseor. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is in the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedor La Omer. In the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year, Kedor La Omer and the sovereigns that were with him came and struck the Raphaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zunim in Ham, and the Emites in Shaway. Puriathayim, and the Horites in the mountain of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they turned back and came to En Misvat, that is Kadesh, and struck all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hatzatan Tamar, and the sovereign of Saddam, and the sovereign of Amora, and the sovereign of Adma, and the sovereign of Tisaboim and the sovereign of Bela, that is, to Soyor, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddim against Kedor La Omer, sovereign of Ilam, and Didal, sovereign of Goim and Amraphel, Sodom of Shinar, and Aryak, sovereign of Elisar, four sovereigns against five. And the valley of Siddim had many tar pits, and the sovereigns of Saddam and Amora fled and fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Amora and all their food and went away. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Saddam, and his goods and left. And one who had escaped came and informed Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And they had a covenant with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And, as he, and, and he and his servants divided against them by night and struck them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is on the left of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. 
and after his return from the striking of Kodor Lam Omer and the sovereigns who were with him, the sovereign of Saddam came out to meet him in the valley of Shaweh, that is the sovereign's valley. And Melchizedek, sovereign of Shalom, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of the most El, high El. And, the ble and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the most high El, processor of the heavens and earth. And blessed be the most high El, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all, and the sovereign of Saddam said to Abram, Give me the people and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the sovereign of Saddam, I have lifted my hand to Yahweh, the most high El, the possessor of the heavens and earth. Not to take a th thread or a sandal strap or whatever is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. Chapter 15. After these events, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward is exceedingly great. And Abram said, Master Yahweh, what would you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, See, you have given me no seed. And see, one born in my house is my heir. And see, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This one is not your heir, but he who comes from your own body is your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look now towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, See, so are your seed. And he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahweh, who brought you out of ur Kasdim to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Master Yahweh, whereby do I know that I possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, and a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took all these to him, and cut them in the middle, and placed each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. And it came to be, when the sun was going, sun was going down, and a deep sleep fell upon Abram, that see a frightening great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, Know for certain that your seed are to be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall inflict them four hundred years. But the nation whom they serve I am going to judge, and afterward let them come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you are to go to your fathers in peace, you are to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the crookedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to be when the sun went down and it was dark that see a smoking oven and a burning torch passing between those pieces. On the same day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, I have given this land to your seed from the river of Mitzrayim to the great river, the river Euphrates with the Canaanite and the Kenzanite and the Kadmonite and the Hittite and the Parasite and the Raphaim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. Amen. And then we have a blessing after the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanu Torah emet, like Yeholaham nata betochenu. Baruch ata Yahuwe, Baruch Shemo no tehen ha Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. You may be seated.
hope this week that you were able to study the Torah portion because there's so much there. Each Torah portion for every Shabbat really helps to fill our lives with the, what Yahweh wants, for, wants to show us each week. And it could be different for each one of you. That's what's wonderful about the Torah is that you have the, um, that insight in the Torah, that, that understanding that each verse has so many different facets to it because he has a many faceted people. So, hallelujah, praise Yahweh for his Torah. Before we begin, let's pray. Abba Father, we praise you. We thank you for the Shabbat day that we can recite your commands together, knowing that keeping your Shabbat is what sets us apart in, in one of the ways that you have for us. We are set apart by your word, your Torah, your Yeshua, the living Torah. We praise you that you're going to come now and teach us with your Ruach, and we look forward to it in Yeshua's name. Amen. I had Marty start with chapter 12. Our triennial portion is, is chapter 14, 1 through, through chapter 15. The whole Torah portion is from 12, 1 all the way through 17, 27. So that's the whole one that, that we're focusing on the middle portion, but I wanted to start with that first part because it's, it's important, kind of leads into the whole portion. So if you look at chap Genesis chapter 12, Bereshith chapter 12, verse 1, Yahweh said to Avram, go yourself out of the land from your relatives, from your father's house, and from the land, and go to a land that I show you. This first verse is actually loaded with a whole lot of things that, are, that apply to us today. It wasn't just Avraham. Did you guys get that? It's loaded with, with a whole bunch of things that are for us today. It wasn't just for Avraham. The name of the Torah portion, of course, is Lech Lecha, which in Hebrew, when I, when I looked it up, it has to do with go out. But you know, Lech Lecha actually means go get. It's like go get. It's like you're talking to someone that you want them to go immediately get out. There's a book years ago that kind of took off on a verse um, that applies to this, I think. It has to do with the get out from under the nations or uh, come out of her, my people, if you remember. Very interesting that Yahweh wants us to, uh, has, has, has dispersed us into the nations. So we're actually, it's called the diaspora, but I was listening to a, a, rabbinic, or a rabbinic Jew a rabbi the other night, and he, he said that, you know, we're actually exiled. And he's referring to his own people, Judah. Well, that's a little bit different than saying that you're in the diaspora, because it almost sounds like it's a nice thing, that we're in the diaspora, we're dispersed. But being exiled is kind of a little different flavor to it, wouldn't you say? Well, here, Avraham... He is in exile, and Yahweh is calling him out. He says, go out, go yourself out from your land, from your relatives, and from your father's house. Well, when I was looking up some of these words, go out, lech lecha, has to do with getting yourself out, and, and, or the word get has to do with walking away. You ever walk away from something? that you're not satisfied with? Uh, yeah, we do that all the time. I've done that in business. I've met with somebody and said, I just, this is not right, and I walk away. Maybe it's something that Yahweh gives you. Yahweh gives you a, um, an intuition, or sometimes we need that from our wives, women's intuition, and men need to listen to that. So we walk away. I also said to depart, but then it said to prosper. And this was part of this definition. And that word, forget, is yalak, to walk away, depart, and then prosper. So you see the progression here? You see that a lot when, you, when you're looking at definitions of, of, 
words in the Torah, it's like a progression of, of a starting point and an ending point. And the starting point generally is not good, but the ending point is great. So just prosper is what it says. So whatever spiritual application you want to put with that, you can derive in your, your own thoughts about how that would go. But, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking well, we're going to walk away from something that is not right, that is, that is anti-Torah, and we're going to walk to something that is Yahweh's ways, and that will help us to prosper. You don't prosper any other way. You know, have you ever, have you ever seen how it appears that an unbeliever is prospering when you're not? Do you ever wonder why? And you say to yourself, well, why, why do they prosper but we don't? Well, maybe we're looking at it the wrong way. Just, just thoughts. If you have a thought about just that aspect, let me know. You can raise your hand and Darren will come around. No, oh, he's in the back. He can, he can actually bless the pagans. And, and do that, and, and that's a witness to us whether we're walking our walk or not. You know, mm -hmm. if, if they're being blessed more than we are, then we need to change our lives. Okay, very good. We have a hard con idea of what pos prosperity is. And as Americans, we think money, wealth, bigger houses, nicer cars, and really it's, it's not talking about those things. I don't remember where because I'm really bad with um, remembering the citations. But isn't there some place in scripture where it talks about where someone asks God, why, why do you bless the wicked? And it was, this is all they get. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. it. They are going to be in hell for the rest of their, the rest yeah. of their eternal lives. So it's not, look, at, you're going to be blessed for eternity and they're going to be condemned. So it's kind of putting it in perspective. Mm -hmm. Very good. I asked the father that same question years ago in Montana. A lady from um, a cultic religion came over and we were sharing, and I was sharing with her. And she tell, shared with me how her mother, who had had a severe knee injury, was healed uh, after they had prayed. And so when uh, this gal left, I walked back up on my porch and said, Father, how is this? How, how can you do this? What is, it? what is this? How can you do that when they're walking in darkness? And he quickly shot to my mind is Matthew 5. And so I just found it, so let me, if I might read it. You've heard that your, our fathers were told, love your en neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Then you'll become children of your Father in heaven, where he makes his sun shine on good and bad people alike. And he sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous alike. I said, oh, thank you, mm -hmm. Father. Hallelujah. I like to pray for people that I don't like and ask Yahweh to bless them in this life, even if they're unbelievers. I, especially, the more I don't like them, the, the, I ask them to prosper them and, 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 and hopefully that they would know his love. But if they don't, I hope they enjoy what life they have. That could also help our liking them too. It does. <laughs> we're supposed to love our enemy as, and we're supposed to love our neighbor I don't see a stipulation in Torah about reasons how that you should love your neighbor as yourself it doesn't give a criteria it just says love your neighbor so. well first we need to get rid of the hatred and the bigotry towards us Christians that's the first thing we need to do and you know when they come at us don't be so hatred you know they're learning too we were there so we need to be a witness to them of what he can do to our lives and what change really means and what he really means about serving him. And when we can witness that to them, then maybe they'll change. Amen. Amen. You know, we're all in a different progression in our walk with Yahweh. And loving your neighbor or loving those that, that were in an assembly with you when you've moved on, um, sometimes it takes time uh, because you're perhaps uh, there's wounds and Yahweh needs to heal those. But you know, Yahweh's in the process of healing and delivering us, and He can actually heal you instantaneously. 
if you just want, if you just let him. Oh, yeah. I believe this came from Abraham Lincoln. It was on the internet, I think, so you know it's true, right? <laughs> but I believe Abraham Lincoln said, uh, I don't like that man. I need to get to know him better. So that's just a putting your foot to the, to the, to the road and walking it out. Amen. Kind of goes along with the idea of wanting to bless someone else instead of yourself. Yahweh will bless you when you bless others. It's kind of a pattern that he set up for us, wouldn't you say? So here in this first verse, it says, go out yourself out of your land. So I looked up land, it has its eretz, it means to be firm, land, nations, and it said wilderness. So it said nations, I thought, okay, what's that, nations? Well, you look up nations, it has to do with Gentile or go, the goy, if you will. The goy would be those that don't have Yahweh, perhaps. You could put in definition, heathen, paganism. So, so, but here, Yahweh is telling Avraham to go out yourself out of your land. So he's, he's telling him to go out of something that, because this land is, it means to be firm. So he's saying, come out of what you have called firm. He's going to take you to, and, he's, and he always says, I'm going to take you to another land, this land that you're going to call firm, the land of your inheritance. So he wants to bring him out of this place that, is, that he has grown to, just grown up in, and perhaps difficult. Have you ever thought of how, how it would be if you were caused to leave here, leave everything behind, leave your home, your, your relatives? everything behind. What would you say to that if Yahweh told you to do that? Would that be uncomfortable for you or would you be, would you be pleased with that? Because he wants to bring you back to, you have a piece of land over in Israel, by the way. It's just waiting for you. So hallelujah. So when I saw this, I thought, okay, he's coming out of this land. Well, it said for land, also this goy or nations, which is paganism. So perhaps in an abstract kind of way, you could say that you're supposed to go out from paganism. Something that is not following Yahweh. He says, go out of this paganism from your relatives and from your father's house. So when I saw the, the relatives, and the, which is kindred, I thought, well, you're, so you're coming out of a place that is not of Yahweh, and Yahweh wants to bring you to a place that is Yahweh's. For his, well, Yahweh owns the whole earth. So, but he has, he has a special place for his people where he wants them to dwell. So he, here you're supposed to go out from your, from your kindred as well, or from your relatives. Well, when you think of relatives and kindred, it's like a family, right? So is, that's where you grew up. That's where you were born. So if you were born there, Yahweh wants you to leave that place where you were born. Now, I was born in Washington, in Seattle. The Seattle Swedish Hospital. Kind of funny because I'm not, I'm not Swedish, I'm Norwegian. But anyway, I was born in the Seattle Swedish Hospital. I didn't know it because I was a baby, so it's okay. <laughs> I don't think they have a Seattle... Um, Norwegian hospital. But anyway, that's where I was born. And so I'm, I was actually born into this place. And because I'm Norwegian, everybody's Lutheran. So is it possible that you're always trying to tell me that I need to come out of that? I need to come out of that, my father's house, it says, to Avraham. He's supposed to come out of his father's house. So is it possible that Yahweh wants us to come out of paganism and from religion that is not of him? When he says, from your land and from your father's house. Just some thoughts for you. Uh, um, they're abstract concepts, but, but you know, I think a lot of Torah is abstract because he does say you need to be born again, and that's an abstract concept. Born again has to do with the covenant that Yahweh wants to make with Avraham, as we'll see farther as we, as we go into the Torah portion, but... His house, 
that he wants us to come out of. I looked this word up as well, and it says a house, temple, dungeon, and prison. So he wants to come out of this place that seems like a dungeon or a prison. In, in Torah concepts, you have, a lot of times, you have a positive and a negative to a word. Well, this seems kind of negative, wouldn't you say? A dungeon or a prison? Would you want to be in a dungeon or a prison? Depends on how, what the dungeon and the prison looked like. I used to take guys up to the, up to the jail, and it was really nice looking. It was, we called it the Hillsboro Hilton. It was, the, it was the jail in Hillsboro. And it, it was really plush. Well, a lot of people that go there because of a crime that they commit, they get out and, they, and, and it's worse on the outside for them than it is on the inside. So they commit a crime so they can get back in. Yeah. Yahweh doesn't want us to get back into that. He wants us to come out to his wonderful um, land that he has for us, the, the Yeshua that he has for us. That Yeshua is before the land. We, we know that because we, we have him. And now he's going to bring us back to the land. One day. Hallelujah. Do you know that a shofar blast is a, has to do with uh, spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is important. And you always people, um, it, it lets the enemy know that we are aware of them. And they don't have a chance in Yeshua's name when we use his name against them. Hallelujah. So this house that, that Avram was to come out of, it said temple, dungeon, prison. And I was, I was thinking about how the opposite is true. Turn to Ephesians chapter, seven, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. He says, And having come, he brought as good news peace to you who were far off, and peace to those near. Because though, through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Maybe you don't have to turn. It says, Shoal is speaking. It says, Because of this, I, Shoal, am a prisoner of Yahweh Messiah on behalf of, of you nations. So he can, you can be a prisoner, but you, where do you want to be a prisoner at? And it says in chapter 4, just look over to chapter 4, verse 1. I call upon you, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Master, to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called, with all humility and meekness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. We talked about that, didn't we? Being eager to guard the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So this prisoner, pri being a prisoner has to do with, in Yahweh Yeshua, ha having to do with humility, having to do with meekness, patience, bearing with one another in love. I, that's, a, that's a great phrase, bearing with one another in love. Wouldn't you say so? Have you had to do that with brothers and sisters, bear with them in love? I don't think anybody would say no. We, we all have to bear with one another. And then it says... But I like what it says after that, being eager to guard the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, one body, one Spirit, as you also were called in one expectation of your calling, one master, one belief, one immersion, one Elohim and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Hallelujah. Don't you just love Yahweh's word? Amen. Turn to 2 Timothy. Chapter 1, 
2 Timothy chapter 1 says in verse, verse 7, For Elohim has not given us the spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love and of self-control. So do not be ashamed of the witness of our master, nor of, of me, his prisoner, but suffer hardship with me for the good news according to the power of Elohim. So being a prisoner means that you're going to suffer in some way hardship for the good news of Messiah Yeshua. Have you had to do that yet? Has anybody in here have to, had to suffer hardship yet for the good news of our Messiah? You know, we, we come across things all, all, all the time. You know, I, if, if you haven't been persecuted by brethren or, or the heathen, perhaps, perhaps you're suffering hardship by the enemy of, the, of our soul. He's got a lot of cohorts with him, sends them out. But we have authority over them in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. So being a prisoner... You can be a prisoner of the realm of life, which is in Messiah Yeshua. You can be a prisoner of the realm of death. I don't know who would choose the death. Do you? Doesn't make sense, does it? Anybody would want to choose our Messiah Yeshua, wouldn't they? But then you have to say, well, why isn't, why isn't everybody choosing our Messiah Yeshua right now? Well, I think there's a, a reason for it. There's probably a whole lot of reasons, but one of the reasons that, that I'm seeing is that they think they have to give something up that they want. The issue is, is that when they do give it up and they do come to a saving knowledge of Messiah Yeshua, they won't want that anymore. They won't want what they thought was great. But it's just getting to them to that point, and, and, and it's Yahweh's Ruach that does that, Yahweh's Spirit that brings them to that. Can you think of a point in your life where, where Yahweh um, is bringing you to a place where he can, you can be more intimate with him? Maybe something's going on with you in your life and the way things are going that you just wonder, why, why is this happening? All things work together, right? For, for the good, for those that are called according to his purpose. I know there's a whole lot more of that verse, but the idea is, is that even in the midst of trial, being a prisoner of our Messiah Yeshua, there's a lot of good things that we, we want to focus on. We can have joy amidst the trial. There's all kinds of different stories of different people that have had joy amidst trial and people watching them go, what is with you? Why are you so joyful amidst this trial that we see you in? And then they say, I want to know what you know. I want to know what gives you that joy. Hallelujah. land of our inheritance is the last part of this chapter 12 verse 1 in, in Genesis going back to the land of, that Yahweh has for us you know Yahweh was brought out when he was 75 years old he was born in 1948 BCE before the common era but the land of Israel was born in 1948 CE. So is it possible that there's a correlation between that 75 years of being born and coming back to the land? If you do the math, it puts us at 2023, or 2023 and a half, perhaps, since Avraham was probably not exactly 75 when he was called out. He was probably a little bit into his 75th year. But there are parallels in scriptures that are important, and names have meanings, and Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, those three men, Yeshua, of course, Joseph down in, there, there's all this picture of the Messiah all through the Torah. And there's a picture of the end times. Yahweh proclaims the end from the beginning. Isn't that true? 
that Yahweh put, isn't that a verse? That he proclaims the end from the beginning. I think it's in Second Peter. But, but the idea is, is that Yahweh wants us to be restored. He wants to restore us back to himself, the living Torah. And you say, well, I, I'm restored. I have Yeshua. Well, just go along a little ways and Yahweh's going to show you something you didn't know. And that should bring us to a point of, of being on our knees and on our faces before him. Can you do that? Can you go on your face before him? In the privacy of your own home, fall on the floor. Cry out to him. Yahweh yeah, loves that kind of heart. Turn to chapter 14. Chapter 14 of Bereshith, Genesis. It's, this is all about four kings fighting against five kings. Wouldn't you expect that? When you get four kings and five kings together, what are they going to do? They're going to war. They're going to fight. Hmm. So I started looking up some of these names. But I also dug in a little bit of history. And this, there's one king here. It's listed in the first verse, chapter 14, verse 1. It came to be in the days of Am, uh, Amraphel, sovereign of Shinar, Ayok, sovereign of Elisar, and Kedorle Amir, sovereign of Elam. This Kedorle Amir is this head king. He's like the king of kings. That's how he's described. And all these other kings, all these other kings serve him. So four of them decided to rebel. Or was it five? One, two, three, four, five. I guess five decided to rebel, right? Five rebelled. Three of the kings stayed with him. And f- so those four kings, the three and him, Kedorle Amir, fought against the five kings. Well, when I looked up this word fighting or warring, as it says in the King James verse, verse two, and they made war against Zebera, sovereign of Sodom and so on, those other kings. So they made war. War, fighting, battle. Lakam. Lakam is the root word for this word war. It means feed on or consume. Making war. When I saw that making war, feed on, consume, the root word of this is lacham, and it means to overcome and prevail. So you're actually taking on someone else's power. In, in that culture, what they did it had to, also had to do with um, shame and um, what, what's the book we're going through? That, uh, Honor and Shame. Okay, a lot of you are going through that book, Honor and Shame and Homeschooling. They, you had to take someone else's, in order to get someone else's honor, you had to shame them in some way in order to get their honor. Does that happen today in our society today? Does that happen in assemblies today where you have to shame someone to get someone, to get someone else's honor? We see it. It's, it's prevalent. It, it, it doesn't go away because there's, there's a defense against it. The defense against it is Yahweh's theology, not man's. Yahweh's theology is give to someone, honor them, and then you will be honored. You don't have to, you don't have to um, take someone else or shame them in order to get honor, but that's what was going on. So here in this battle or this war, they were feeding on or consuming, if you will, these other, these other kings. So they had to take their power away. They were trying to get that power. They, they wanted that power back. So Kedale Amir, that head king of kings, he had all these kings serving him at one time. And then they rebelled. So overcome and prevail is the Hebrew word yakol. 
Yakol has to do with taking on someone else's power, and that's what they were going to do. They were taking on these other kings' power. Well, that word is used when Jacob was wrestling with the incarnate Yeshua, I believe. Perhaps, perhaps you know, there's other teachings about who it was that Jacob was, was wrestling with. But the idea is that, that this angel, if it indeed was Yeshua, that word Yakol has to do with Yeshua not being able to get Jacob to take on his power. And then finally Jacob does, takes on Yeshua's power. Well, how do you do that? How do you take on someone else's power, the, the power of Yeshua? How do you take on his power for your life today? I'm asking you the question. We need to know how to do this. I know from what I've experienced, uh, it really begins with humility and that, that place where you can be on your face before him and that pride is broken and then he's able to draw near to you. Amen. I, I hold on to him like, like Jacob did and don't let go, even in pain. I still re reach out to him and, and thank him and praise him and, and just hold on to his word, his, all those promises. He is true. And, and, and don't get shaken from that. Hold on to his zitzit, so to speak, the commandments, and just be true to them. And I know everything's going to be fine. So mentioning, talking about humility before him, this is, this is right. This is a key um, thing. You know, there's a word out there in, in Christendom in, 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 in the world today, and it's the word submission. One time I was, I was working on a construction job with my friend, and he was actually the, helping me frame this building. And he was talking about his girlfriend and how his girlfriend, he was, he was having all this trouble with his girlfriend because she didn't want to submit to what he wanted her to do. Well, he wasn't the greatest guy, but, but I think it all has to do with the husband. That's the reason why we submit to our Abba Father first, and then that, that picture is brought down to a husband and wife relationship to where she wants to honor him in submission to him. But, but, it, but it also has to do with being private and separate unto each other. First to Yahweh and then, and then to each other. So the word submission can be rendered as being private and separate. But this word submission, we were talking about it. I was talking about it with my friend. And I said, yeah, well, she just doesn't want to submit to you. She doesn't want to be in submission. And I, and I looked at my friend, and he was giving me this kind of this um, sheepish look, kind of like he was embarrassed. And he kind of goes, and I turned around, and there was his girlfriend standing right there. And she, was, she didn't have a very pleased look on her face. So, so uh, I don't know if she ever if they ever worked out the issues, but <laughs> but being in submission to one to another is very important. It's like, it's like uh, Yahweh wants us by his side. He wants, to, he wants to walk with us. Our husband wants to walk with us. It's difficult for me, like if I, if I go into a store and my wife is kind of lagging behind me, I, I want her up with me. I want her right by my side. Hallelujah. I know you all don't read the Kabbalah, so let me show you something. Um, this is uh, the duties of the heart. And the one word in common speech denotes both accidental transitory unity and a unity that is essential and permanent. Is this essential and permanent unity that is true unity? Even where the one word in the sense of accidental unity does not refer to obviously collective units or composite wholes such as species, one army, etc., but is spoken of one man, even then it denotes a plurality. Very good. Okay. Someone else? I don't know if you'll get to this or not, um, but if I'm taking your thunder, forgive me. <clears throat> This is how you were talking about being born again. And when we do that, when we commit, when we submit our lives to Yahweh, that he is our king, our master. Now going into 
what Avram said to the king of Sodom who wanted to bless him and give him gifts. Avram says, I have raised my hand in an oath to Yahweh Elohim, excuse me, Yahweh El Elyon, maker of heaven and earth. If Avram had accepted a gift from this earthly king, he would have broken that singularity of allegiance to Yahuwah. Mm -hmm. And in that, he would have um, been sinful. He broke it. And so that would be a word to us, too, that when we have proclaimed that Yahuwah Yeshua is our Savior and King and Master, we should not align ourselves with anything in the world or anything other than just him, and be careful to guard that to keep that. Very good, very good. Someone else. This Kedule Amir was king of kings here with all these with all these kings, and the and the verse that Eileen just quoted was was chapter fourteen, verse twenty two says, and Abraham said to the sovereign of Saddam, this Bara. I have lifted my hand to Yahweh, the Most High El, the possessor of heaven and earth, not to take a thread or a sandal strap from whatever is yours, lest you should say that you made Avram rich. Well, back in that culture, they had their God, and then there was the king. I know that in the Egyptian culture, theoretically, the, the, the Pharaoh was considered God on earth, Ra. But in here, from what I've read, it's, it appears that they, they have their God and that if you violated any of their God's um, uh, decrees, and those decrees would be set up, if you will, almost by this king of kings, and he would say to you what you have to do, and this, and, and this has to do with their God. But, but Avraham obviously knew this because he's raising his hand. He says, I, I have lifted my hand to Yahweh, the most high El. You don't lift your you lift your hand to that king. So what he was proclaiming, it appears, is that he was proclaiming that this king that he was raising his hand to is also his God. And I'm not, I'm not sure, but I don't think that culture believed that. I think they believed that gods were one thing and that, and the, and the, that the king could not be the God. And he was proclaiming that that was the way it was for his God, his, his Elohim, is that he was king and God. So Avraham did this because, like Eileen said, you, we, we, we don't want to take anything. We, we want to honor our Abba in every way. It doesn't mean that, that, that we're, I mean, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? So we do, we do get monies from different places. But honoring him, having our, um, our worth in him is far more than, than rubies and jewels. Amen. So this Keterle Amir, you know, names have meanings. So this Keter Leomir, when I looked him up, it means, and this is from different sources, and I just kind of put them all together. It says, servant of a dark, turbulent warfare that leads to a wasted heap of ashes. That's this meaning of his name. How, what an awful name. Servant of a dark, turbulent warfare that leads to a wasted heap of ashes. And by the way, turbulent is, means without rest. What would be the opposite? What would be the opposite of that for us? Yeshua, yeah. So we're the servant of this, of the opposite of a turbulent, or without rest would be a bright, restful victory, the warfare, now we have victory, so a servant of a bright, restful victory that leads to a useful new man that's been restored, not a wasted heap of ashes, but a, a, a useful man, and I'm saying that with, for, in regards to all of us, that new man in our Messiah Yeshua been restored. So there's opposites, and we, wanna, we want to focus on 
Yes, we're in the world. We need to know, we need to understand about the world and the evil ways of Hasatan, but we also see how we have this amazing victory in, in our Messiah, Yeshua. Melchizedek. Melchizedek here. When you go to uh, verse 18, this Melchizedek, sovereign of Shalom, verse, chapter 14, verse 18 of Genesis, well, it's actually two words. Melech, and Zadik. You put the two together and we just pronounce it as Melchizedek, but it's actually Melech Zadik, king of righteousness. It would be translated from Hebrew into English because Zadik is righteous, righteousness. So this, this um, Melech or this, uh, the, uh, Melchizedek that Abraham gave a tenth of all to, Turn to Hebrews chapter 7, and we'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, sovereign of Shalom, priest of the Most High El, whom, who met Abraham returning from the the slaughter of the sovereigns and blessed him to whom also Avraham gave a tenth of all his name being translated indeed first sovereign of righteousness and then also sovereign of shalom or of salam that is sovereign of peace and then it says in verse 3 without father without mother without genealogy having neither beginning nor end of end nor end of life who does that describe to you? Seems to describe Yeshua. And then it says, but having been made like the son of Elohim remains a priest for all time. This has to do with in the order of Melchizedek. Well, that having been made like the son of Elohim, in, in Hebrew thought would be more something like, but having his position as the son of Elohim. I don't want to change scripture, but that's a possibility. Because it just got done saying, if it says made like, it just it contradicts what it just said previously. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, without neither beginning nor end of life. So he wasn't made, he always was. Now see how great this one was, to whom even the ancestor Avraham gave a tenth of the choice booty. Amen. So this king of righteousness, it says that he is after the order of Melchizedek. And I just want to share this one last thing with you and then we'll close. But this order of Melchizedek has to do with, when you look it up, it's, it's the root word of this word order is debar, which is word. Or a matter spoken of. So you could say, priest forever according to the word of the king of righteousness. Amen. Let's pray. Abba Father, we thank you and praise you once again for your word, for our Messiah Yeshua who manifests himself all through the Torah. He comes to us when we need him. He came to Avraham when he needed him. He came to all the patriarchs when they needed him. He came to all of the Israelites' defense when they needed him and he delivered them. All he wants us to do is to believe him and trust him. And scripture says in our Torah portion that Abraham believed Yahweh and it was counted to him for righteousness. Let us be righteous before you because we believe you. Not anything in ourselves causes our righteousness, only our belief in you, our Messiah Yeshua. Yahweh, the living Elohim, our Savior, our Messiah. Thank you and praise you now and how you're going to work in the rest of our service as we fellowship together and encourage one another to lift each other up. In Yeshua's name and in your name, O Yahweh, amen. You are dismissed for fellowship.